But I'm, I'm saying that for those of us, many of you, most of you, your heart is truly after God. Your heart is not after what God can do for you, what God can give you. You want to know him. You want to know God. You want fellowship with God. You want communion with God. And then you look out and you see the, hmm, what's the word I can use? You see the people of God who I also believe are truly seeking after the heart of God being drawn in and being sucked in to so many things that in the end really don't make any difference. They really don't make any difference. Um, it could be because I'm getting older and I'm realizing that life really is short. That has hit me again this week. That life is short. And truly the only thing that is going to last is what we do for Christ. When it's all been said and done, right? When it's really all been said and done, only what we do for Christ will last. Many people don't know mm, because I don't talk about my testimony a lot. But I grew up in a, in a pretty affluent home. I grew up, my father was very well to do. My father was, many, and many of you all know, was one of the original African-American pioneers in broadcasting. He got into radio in 1946. By 1956, he was a household name nationwide. My father-in-law, or my, my, my godfather, was Solomon Burke, the great soul singer, Solomon Burke. My, my brother's godfather is B.B. King. These are the individuals that I grew up around. Good friends with <laughs> Kathy Sledge from Sister Sledge. Stanley Clark grew up in the same neighborhood. Most of the people that I went to school with back in the 60s, their fathers were doctors. They were lawyers. They were politicians. They were affluent individuals. During a time when for African Americans, you know, they didn't all live in the suburbs. I, you, you know, when I found out that all African Americans didn't live in the suburbs, I was shocked. I thought everybody grew up the way that I did. I thought everybody grew up out on the boat with their dad. I thought everybody grew up flying around the country to, to disc jockey conventions. I thought everybody grew up riding mini bikes. I thought everybody grew up in affluence because that's what I knew. I didn't know what poverty was. I had no idea what poverty was. Never knew what poverty was. And I watched many of these individuals become very successful in their lives. I watched B.B. King go from the Chitlin Circuit to Carnegie Hall. Everybody knows who B.B. King is. Good friend of the family. These are the individuals that, that I was blessed to grow up around and watch these individuals become successful. Watch these individuals make a name for themselves. Watch these individuals become rich and famous. Watch these individuals become great successes and household names. But the reality of the matter is, they all died. They all died. They did what they did in life, but they died. No matter what we achieve in life, in the final analysis, beloved, only what we do for Christ really matters. Only what we do for Christ really matters. I made the statement a little earlier that as we are going through our motions and as we are going through our hoopla and as we're going through all of the excitement that we go through in our church services, 
men and women outside of the kingdom, men and women outside of the church are dying every day, possibly never having anyone tell them about the love of God, never having anyone really share with them the truth of the gospel, the fact that Jesus really loves them, the fact that Jesus isn't mad at them, the fact that Jesus didn't come to condemn the world, the fact that, you know, Jesus really is the savior of the world. Because many people's understanding of Christ is very warped. Many people's understanding of God is very warped. Many people believe God is behind all of the tragedy because the enemy has done a fairly good job at messing with the church's theology. The enemy has done a pretty good job of, of messing with the church's understanding of God. We see this even among our own. We, we see this among ourselves. We are we're fighting against one another. We're we are so politically torn. <laughs> you know, doesn't matter if you're a Christian anymore. People want to know: Are you a Democrat? Are you a Republican? Are you conservative? Are you liberal? It's not: Are you a believer? Do you believe in Jesus? Is do you know Jesus? Because we have been sucked into. We have been sunk into the deception that has the whole world deceived today. We have been sunk into the same deception that people really believe that things will just go on the way that they're going forever, right? We'll live and we'll die and then the next generation, they'll do what they're going to do and the next generation, they're going to do what they do. Folks, do we realize that, that today, as we are sitting here talking, today, as we are sitting here talking, that there are men and women, there are men and women who have given their lives to work for the government and for the well-being of these United States who have been working, hmm, who who although they are working, they're not getting paid. Why? Because our government is shut down. We need to really think about this, beloved. How do you say the government is shut down? How, how do you even imagine the government shut down? The government shut down. Why? Because of someone's ego? Possibly. Because of someone's own bias? Because of someone's prejudice? Because of someone's self-centeredness? Because we, you know, because those that we elect to represent us and to look out for our well-being are more concerned with, with padding their pockets than the health of the people that are putting them in office. And we really believe that this is just going to go on and it's just going to go on. We in the body today, we, we watch these things happen. We, we sit back and we watch these things happen where they talk about putting up, and I'm not making a political statement, I'm just making a point. I'm just, I'm just making a point. Where the government feels as though if they believe that certain people are detrimental to the well-being of how they think the nation and the world ought to be, well, that's very simple. We just build a wall. Or better still, we just build some cages and put them in cages, separate their children, put up camps, put up tents, put them in pup tents, and feel totally justified in doing it because it helps the American way. Folk, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to, <laughs> I'm not trying to give you a downer message. I'm just trying to. I'm just trying to speak some things to you that hopefully will start your brain to thinking. What happens, what happens when they begin to take that same type of attitude 
towards people proclaiming the gospel of Christ. What happens when, when, when they say, well, these people over here, they, you know, they want to worship God, but they don't, they don't want to do it the way that we say that they should do it. They don't, they don't necessarily want to be, they don't want to go along with just the cultural Christian thing. They, they want to get all fanatical, you know, they, 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 <laughs> You know, they they, they want to, they just want to keep talking about Jesus. They just want to talk about Jesus saving people. They, you know, they, they just, you know, they don't understand you. You know, you can talk about Jesus, but, you know, talk about Jesus when you go to church. You know, that's for Sunday. Talk, talk about Jesus in your home. Don't, don't take them into the marketplace. You know, don't, don't be talking about Jesus on the job. That's not where you're supposed to talk about Jesus. Don't talk about Jesus in the marketplace, you know, keep your religion private, you know, you know, faith is private, you know, you, you, you know, you can't tell people that, you know, that, that Jesus is the only savior, you can't tell people that, that Jesus is the only way that men and women can be reconnected to God, you, 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 you know, you, you, you just can't do that, you can't tell people that, that, you know, that, that Islam can't save, you can't, Tell people that that Buddha doesn't save. You can't tell people that that that, that Krishna is not a true God. You you can't do that. You can't. You just can't say that Jesus is the only way, right? We can't have that. You're you're bringing discord to the nation. You're you're you're, you're being a threat to our civil society. Well, what happens when everything that we're seeing happen? to people of other nations, to people of, of other ethnic groups. What happens when all of that stuff begins to turn towards the church? What happens? What happens then? Or perhaps we believe that, that as believers that would never happen to us. The, you know, the body of Christ would never be persecuted. You, you can't be persecuted in America right? America's a Christian nation. You know, you can never be persecuted in America. You can never be persecuted in America. That happens in third world countries. That happens in, in countries that are ruled by dictators. That, you know, that, that, that happens in countries where, where you have rulers, you know, who, who are only out for themselves, as if our rulers in America aren't only out for themselves. What happens when they try to tell believers how to worship God and how not to worship God? What happens then? What 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 happens? Where where will our where will our success principles get us then? Huh? Where will our, our declarations of, of, of decreeing and declaring, will, where will that get us then? Where, where will our words of knowledge get us then? Where will our prophecies get us then? If we have not learned to be the people of God, if, if we have not learned how to connect with one another, if we have not learned how to support one another, if we have not learned how to pray for one another, if we have not learned how to encourage one another, if we have not truly learned how to help our brothers and sisters walk in a healthy relationship with Jesus to where it doesn't matter what happens in the world. It doesn't matter what happens in society because we know and they know that there is a God. There is a God who said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. There is a God who has declared that his will will be done. There is a God who still rules in the affairs of men from heaven. There is still that God who is sovereign that we are accountable to. What happens then, beloved? What happens then? Where are we as the people of God? Where, I mean, I, I mean, really, where are we? Where, where are we? If you were to, if, if, let's just say, if you were to die tonight, 
do you know for sure? Do you know for sure? Mm, mm, mm. That all things are right with you and God. Do you know for sure? In other words, do you really have the witness of the spirit in your own heart? that you are justified with God? Or do you only get the witness of the Spirit when you're in the midst of the congregation and everybody is shouting and the preacher is up there performing, going through all of the shenanigans and whatnot, working up the emotions? Is that the only time that you're sure that your relationship with Christ is okay? Is is that the only time that you're sure that that you can really hear from God when somebody gives you a word of prophecy? Is is that the only time that that you're sure? Is that the only time when you can open your scriptures and, and read the word of God and hear the voice of God speaking to you? Is when a pastor or a preacher or an apostle or or someone else is opening the scriptures for you? If, 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 if you were in a situation where you had no Bible, b- beloved, listen to me. There have been periods of time in the history of the church when Bibles were banned. Do you understand what I'm saying? And please don't tell me that could not happen in America, beloved. America is not the nation that you think it is. I'm just trying, I'm, 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 I'm just saying I'm glad that I was born in America, but America is not the nation that you think it is. America looks <laughs> like a lamb. But when America opens its mouth and begins to speak, it speaks just like a dragon. It looks harmless, but look at its laws. Look at the way it treats its people. Not just African-Americans, all people. Look at the way it treats the poor. Look at the way it treats people from from other nations. Look at the way it treats people. Look, Look at America's history is all I'm saying, beloved. And let's not believe, let's not fall for the lie that America is the kingdom of God. Right? Let's not fall for the lie. We live in a nation where, where how, you know, how many other schools, how many other schools, let me talk to you that have children, how many other schools have to experience a mass murder for people to begin to understand something needs to be done about the access to guns. Now, we can come up with all the political shenanigans that we want to come up with, and we can talk all of the stuff that we want to talk about. Oh, guns don't kill, people do, right? You know, people just have mental health issues. Okay, well, if that's the case, why don't we take, why don't we really take some resources, right? And and let's let's pour those resources back into creating places where those who are mentally challenged can really get some help. There used to be a time where we had mental hospitals where people that had issues could be housed. But what happened? We shut them down. And then what happened to all of the people that had the mental issues? They were turned out into the streets. See? Then we complain because we want to call them bums and we want to call them this and we want to call them that. No, these are probably people who went through some serious hard times in their life and they were stressed out and the enemy took advantage of them and they broke. But we just say they're bums. They're lazy. They don't want to work. This is the mentality that exists in our nation, beloved. And the sad tragedy is it often exists in the church as well. It often exists in the church as well. If people in the church are struggling, what do we say nowadays? Oh, they need to have more faith. If they had more faith, they wouldn't be going through anything. Faith is not faith is not a magic bullet to to prevent people from going through challenges. 
Read the scriptures again. Those who, who really walked in faith had great challenge. Read Hebrews 11 again. But read it from the scriptures, not from your favorite faith teacher who is only trying to spin the faith message to get your money. But read it from the scriptures. Consider Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He despised the shame. Right? Now he is set down at the right hand of the Father. Why? Because he understood that God so loves humanity that he needs a people who understands what it means to be selfless. That there needs to be a people who don't live for themselves. They really do live for other people. Is it easy? No, because we all have to deal with our own human ego. We all have to deal with our natural sense of self-preservation. And we all want to consider ourselves first. That's what makes the life of faith for anyone. That's what makes it for anyone. A challenge, which is why Jesus says you have to deny yourself. There is no way, there is no way to live a life pleasing to the Father outside of allowing the Spirit of God to live through you. We don't have the capability within ourselves to live a life pleasing to God, but we haven't learned that yet. And the Father doesn't even ask us to do it. He asks us to lay down our weakness, to lay down our fear, to lay down all of those things and allow His Spirit to fill our lives. But the only way the Spirit of God can continually fill us is we have to be continually emptied of ourselves. But so much of what we're preaching today, so much of what we're hearing as the gospel, it is causing us to be more self-oriented. It's causing us to be more self-centered. Not more Christ-like, it's causing us to be more self-like. It's not causing us to become, to become conformed to the image of Christ, it's really causing us to be conformed to the image of the beast, to where we have more beastly activity. We, more, we, we act more like, oh my God, we act more like devils than we do children of God. I'm not calling you all devils. I'm saying, with a lot of the preaching and the teaching that's going on, in the body of Christ is causing us to be more demonic than it's actually causing us to be more, more spiritual in the true sense of the word spiritual. That's why when, when it starts talking about love your neighbor as you love yourself. It didn't say love your black neighbor as you love yourself. It didn't say love your white neighbor as you love yourself. It didn't say love your Hispanic neighbor. It said love your neighbor. Then he said, well, who is my neighbor? And then he gave the story of the, of, of the good Samaritan, right? Who is your neighbor? Everyone is your neighbor. Who is your brother that you should be concerned about? Everyone is your brother. Not just, not, not, not just your brother because you're born out of the same ethnic race. This, and this is, this is one of the main reasons that... that <sighs> This is one of the main reason, uh, reasons, and I'm, and I'm going to keep talking about it, but this is one of the main reasons racism is still so prominent in the church. It's one of the main reasons that racism is still more prominent in the church because we haven't yet learned what it means to follow Jesus. We haven't yet learned what it means to be a Christian. Not a white Christian or a black Christian or a Pentecostal Christian or a, a charismatic Christian. To be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus. Not a follower of Jesus who promotes black power. Not a follower of Jesus that promotes, if you're white, you're right. No, that is not Christianity. I'm sorry. And our churches are infested with that spirit. It's infested with that spirit. And it's on both sides. It's on both sides. Can we justify 
you know, I, I, I mean, can we justify why as African Americans, you know, we have certain feelings towards um, our white brothers and sisters based upon history. Is it justifiable to be suspect of some of, of some white brothers and sisters? Absolutely. It's justifiable in the natural, but we're not but we're not called to live natural lives we are called to live beyond that we are called to be examples of the redeeming power of god we are called to be examples of reconciliation that's what we're called to be it doesn't matter who's right or who's wrong we're all wrong in the eyes of god we are called to demonstrate the reality that outside of the kingdom of God, there is no possible way for humanity to survive. It's Babylon all over again. The nations were divided at Babel and they have been warring ever since. And the only thing that can reverse that is the power of Pentecost where the spirit of God is poured out upon all flesh. And now there is no Jew. There is no Greek. There is no Gentile. There is no male. There is no female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. When will we get to that point where we hear the heart of Jesus when he prayed in the garden? He said, Father, I pray that they might be one. That is my desire. My God. Hmm. That's what it's talking about. That's what it's talking about. So as we are witnessing what's taking place in the world, for those of us who don't have our head buried in the sand, for those of us who, you know, for those of us who do not believe that our politicians are the solution, for those of us who realize that the world is in crisis, the world is in crisis, beloved. This is not a temporary hiccup that's taking place in America right now. I made the statement earlier and I'm going to make the statement of again. Judgment is hitting America. That's what's going on. J yes, I said that word. Judgment is hitting America. But judgment is also hitting the body of Christ. And it's not a judgment to condemn. It's a judgment to correct. Right? It's a judgment to to correct. That's what's taking place. And there is no easy fix for this, right? There is no easy fix for this. This isn't, this is not about Congress and the Senate getting together and deciding to vote to make America great again. And then poof, all of our problems go away. That's not, that's not what this is about, beloved. It's, it's not. Remember what happened to the Roman Empire. Rome fell from the inside. Rome fell because of its own corruption. America is nothing but another attempt to establish Rome, a democracy, a republic. That's all America is. And America is crumbling from the inside. It's crumbling from the inside because of the sin, because of the iniquity, because of the hard heartedness, be, you know, because of the resistance to the grace of God. America is coming up under a judgment. It's not a judgment because God is mad. America is reaping the results of the seeds that she has sown. Remember, the scripture still says, the scripture still says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. That includes nations. If nations sow bad seed, they're going to reap a bad harvest. And America has a history of sowing bad seed. And now the harvest is starting to manifest now. See, all of the stuff that was up under the surface is starting to manifest now, right? It's starting to manifest. So, so, so what does that mean for those in the body of Christ? That means that this becomes the time when our light ought to shine the brightest. Now is the time for the church to stand up and give a true witness for Christ. Now is the time 
when believers really need to understand and really begin to apply. Watch these principles of prosperity that we believe are for us right? That when there is a famine that is hitting a nation, we in the body of Christ, since we believe in prosperity so much, right? Since we believe God can meet all of our needs, we ought to be the ones who are demonstrating to the people outside of the body of Christ that they can put their trust in God and God will meet their need even if the government doesn't pay them, even if they can't buy their, 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 their medicine for their health, even if they can't provide their health care. We have a God that can heal. See, this is where the gospel really comes in now. See, this is where those of us who, who say we believe in divine healing, because there are going to be people who are going to need God's healing because they can't get their medicine. There are going to be people that have to have a supernatural supply from God because they don't have the finances, you see. Now, let's see where our faith really is. But if our faith is just simply... Well, if they believe like I believed, they would have it. That's not going to cut it, beloved. The church is being called to be a witness. The church is being called to be a witness. The church is being called to be a witness. The commission remains the same. Go into all of the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go teach every nation. Go proclaim the gospel. It has not changed. And the gospel remains the same. The gospel is still the story. Hmm. That God so loved the world that he wanted humanity redeemed with him so much. He wanted humanity redeemed so bad. He became one of us. That God laid aside all of his divine rights and all of his divine privileges and was born into the race of Adam. And he suffered being tempted just like all of us. But he lived a life of obedience to the Father. Hmm. He died for all of us. He died that we might live. And he was raised from the dead. And he forever lives to make intercession for each and every one of us. Beloved, that's the gospel. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all of the world for witness, and then the end shall come. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all of the world for witness, and then the end will come. We are real close to the end, beloved. We are real close to the end. We're real close to the end. And we have the opportunity to participate with God in the greatest revival the world has ever seen, a revival that is going to usher in the return of the Lord Jesus. But I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you the question that has been weighing on my heart heavy lately. Because this is what I've been hearing the Father say to me, and I said it a little earlier. This is for me. He said, Daryl, are you really willing? Hmm. Are you really willing to walk in my anointing, preach my gospel, hmm, and receive the reproach that goes along with it. Are you really willing to suffer for the gospel of Christ? Are you really willing to lay down your life that men and women might hear 
the truth of the word of God? Are you really willing to be looked at as strange? Are you really willing to be called fanatical? Are you really willing to be called out there? I don't know what happened to him. He used to be okay. And now, you know, it seems like, you know, all he wants to talk about, you know, he used to just talk about Jesus all the time before. Now he really just talking about Jesus and the church and the gospel and the loss and the second coming. Are you really willing to walk in that? Are you really willing to carry my cross? Because if you are willing to carry my cross, I will be with you every step of the way. If you truly want to follow me, you will have to deny yourself. You will have to pick up your cross because that's the only way you can follow me. That's the only way you can follow me. If you really want to hear the father say at the end, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You're going to have to walk in obedience to the word of God. There is no other way. There is no other way. So I just ask you, as I've just shared out of my heart, and thanks for allowing me to share. Thanks for hanging in there. I just ask you to just really ask God to help you to search your heart, to really spend some time, really spend some time, some quiet time, not asking the Father for anything, just allowing the Father to speak to you and to show you those areas in your life where you may not really have been willing to just lay it all down. Hmm. Return back to your first love. Let God set you on fire like you were when you first got saved. You know, you just couldn't you know, you couldn't stop telling people about Jesus. That's how we all were before we got real religious. Let God put the fire back in you. Hmm. I'm not talking about wildfire. I'm not talking about wildfire. I'm talking about the fire of the Holy Spirit. Because there's a world that needs to hear the good news of the Savior. They don't want to hear about church. They don't want to hear about religion. They don't want to know a biblical success principle. They've, they, they've, they've had all of that in the world. They don't want to come into the church and hear the same stuff covered over with some scripture. They want to know about Jesus. They want to know the real Jesus. They want to know the Jesus that that walked the shores of Galilee. They want to know the Jesus that, that healed lepers. They want to know the Jesus that opened blinded eyes. They, they want to know the Jesus who could, who could say to the woman caught in adultery, if no man condemns you, neither do I. Just go and sin no more. They want to know the Jesus that can cause them to walk again, to, to hear again. They want to know the Jesus that can comfort their heart in the midst of darkness. They want to know the Jesus who can comfort them when they're losing their loved ones. They want to know Jesus. My God, they want to know Jesus. And how is Jesus going to be seen? He's going to be seen through his body. That's you and I. Jesus wants to manifest himself through you and I. But are we willing to die that Christ might live in us? That, beloved, is the question. That's the question. I love you all. I pray for you all daily. And I ask you all to continue to pray for me. I ask you all, if God ever puts it on your heart to send me an email like Brother Hugh and Issa and, and so many others of you who have written just short emails of, of words of encouragement, do that. Because every time I've received something like that from someone, it's what I needed at that moment to get me through. 
and I'll do the same for you. Let's learn what it means to be in real fellowship with one another. Be in real fellowship. Doesn't mean we have to be each other's best buds, but we need to be checking in on each other. We need to be encouraging one another. We need to be keeping each other in check. When we start seeing each other getting off base, we need to tap each other on the shoulder. And because we have relationship one with another, because we have fellowship one with another, we can be corrected by one another. You see how this works? We have to learn how to hold one another accountable in our walk with the Lord. That takes humility. That takes brokenness. How deep the Father's love. I want to read just a passage of scripture for you, and then I want to pray uh, before we before we depart. I want to read this. Coming out of Paul's writing to the Philippians, chapter 2. Paul encourages us to let this mind hmm, be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation and he took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And wherefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name, which is above every name that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. Jesus Christ is Lord. He's not becoming Lord. He is Lord. He became Lord because he humbled himself and he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, wherefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven, things on earth, things under the earth. There are no angels. There are no demons. There are no men who will not bow at the name of Jesus. But how did he get that name? He got that name because he humbled himself. He emptied himself. He identified with us. Then being identified with us, he came and he served us. He served a people who didn't even want to receive him, but he still served them. And he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And so when Jesus calls us to follow him, he calls us to follow him as he is our example. Paul says, let this mind, let this attitude, let this be your way of thinking. That though God has reconciled you and given you power and given you authority, and though God has raised you up and made you sit together in heavenly places in Christ, don't let it be something that caused you to become an inflated bag of flesh, let it be something that you know 
who you are in God and who God is in you. And because you have that position in God, you can humble yourself and you can serve others. You can humble yourself and esteem other better than yourselves. You can put other people's needs before your own. Why? Because you know your God will supply all of your needs. So you can put the needs of others before your own. Beloved, that's what I'm striving for. I'm not there yet, but that's what I'm striving for, that I can have that type of mind, that type of attitude. Mm. So you all pray for Brother Daryl as I pray for you. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. Most of all, Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his death that gave us life. And Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters that are listening to this conversation, those who are watching this conversation by replay. Father, I pray that your spirit will continue to minister to them, that, that the spirit will continue to fill them, that the spirit will continue to lead them and guide them, that your spirit will comfort them. Father, I pray for those that are going through struggles in their life, for those who are battling temptation. Father, I join my faith with theirs. I join my faith with theirs. And Father... I pray that we all not only get the victory, but that we walk in the victory that Jesus has already given us. Father, I pray for a fresh infilling of your spirit for your people. Father, I pray that we might know the love of Christ that passes all understanding. Father, I pray that we might be one. Father, I pray that we be the witnesses in the earth that you've called us to be. Father, I pray. I bless my brothers and sisters in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, thank you all again for hanging in there. And I have to say, I love you all. I really do. I'm just not saying it to say it. I love you all. Because I know that you, like me, as I play this last song, I know that you, like me, have this as a testimony. Because nobody knows. Nobody knows but Jesus. I'm gonna leave you with this. I bless you. But I did wanna come on to let you know that I've just released my most recent book entitled The Pattern of the House. The subtitle is very interesting. Uh, the title again is The Pattern of the House. The subtitle is Restoring God's Purpose, Pattern, Processes, Presence, and Power. Now, the gist of the book is to uh, look at the different patterns that uh, God had given to his people throughout history. Uh, beginning with the sanctuary, you'll remember that God told Moses to have the people build him a sanctuary that he might dwell among his people. He said, but make sure that they build it according to the pattern that I've shown you in the mountain. And after the people had assembled the tabernacle according to the pattern, God's presence filled the sanctuary. We see the same thing happening with David. We know that David wanted to build a temple for the Lord, but David was not able. But we do read that David gave the pattern of all that he had to his son Solomon. And the result was that Solomon built the temple 
according to the pattern. And again, what happened? The glory of God filled the temple. Moving forward, we know that Jesus was God manifested in the flesh. It says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word dwelt literally means tabernacle. Jesus is the true tabernacle in which the presence of God is manifested. Jesus in turn gave the pattern to the church. He gave the pattern to the apostles. The apostles built the church according to the pattern and the rest is history. We see the church moving out in the book of Acts and signs and wonders and miracles with with numbers of people being saved. The scripture actually says that the Lord added daily to the church such as should be saved. You see, it's when we follow the patterns of God that we get the results that God intends for us to get. Today, we're seeing a lot of our churches struggling. We're seeing a decline in the church because we've built the church using different patterns. You see, we built the church using all different kinds of structures. We have denominational structures, we have committee structures, we have institutional structures. And as the result, we're not seeing the growth or the effectiveness of our local churches. And this is one of the things that I am addressing in the book, The Pattern of the House. So I want to encourage you to go out to Amazon. The book is available in both the Kindle for instant download. The paperback is also available. They are both priced very reasonably. So I want to encourage you to go out today Get your copy of The Pattern of the House, Restoring God's Purpose, Patterns, Process, Presence, and Power. You'll be glad that you did. Stay blessed.